Welcome to the WREL Daily Download. I'm Luis Fernandez. Cases of flesh-eating bacteria are on the rise across the southeast. North Carolina has tallied 59 Vibrio cases, a specific strain, which is the second highest midsummer total in five years. Doctors say the flesh-eating bacterium can destroy tissue and become deadly in fewer than 48 hours. Kind of gives you chills thinking about it. I want to welcome WRL climate change reporter Liz McLaughlin, who's been covering this story. Liz, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. So, Liz, how dangerous is something like this? We hear flesh-eating bacteria, and I I don't know, it kind of rackets up, ratchets up the the list of dangerous things for me. It's absolutely terrifying, but it is rare. So to give you a little, um, you know, a little solace if you're heading to the beach, um, you know, in the coming days or weeks, uh, trying to sneak in one last trip before the school year, perhaps. It is very rare, but it is a very fast-moving bacteria, so it can reproduce really quickly. I spoke with a scientist yesterday who said even every 15 minutes, um, this bacteria can couple. So it's very fast-moving, and as you mentioned, um, some patients can die within 48 hours. Um, This bacteria has dozens of strains. There's one that's particularly dangerous called um, Vibrio fulnificus, and that's what usually can lead to necrotizing fasciitis. That's the kind of flesh eating aspect of it, or even something like sepsis. Um, and so, if left untreated, it's really scary. And that's something that um, you know people could could have a lookout for and and try to get medical attention really quickly if they're if they're suffering from some symptoms. Who is at greatest risk for this? Who who should be careful? So how you get it? The exposure is generally from brackish water, so a mix of salt water and fresh water, so that's in a lot of sounds and estuaries, um, and raw seafood um, can have can have this Vibrio in it, and it's, you know, getting more common as scientists, again, with UNC that I spoke with yesterday said that there are some strain of Vibrio in almost every sample that they take now, so um, really anyone who's in contact with the water with a cut, and that could be anything from a new tattoo to a nick from shaving, um, or any, you know, if from consuming or touching raw seafood. Now, the average person, maybe who's going on a recreational fishing trip or having some sushi, you know, that's a small likelihood that they're going to be exposed and, and maybe get something potentially fatal. But if you're someone like a commercial fisherman or a shrimper, um, you're out there eight hours a day, um, you know, pulling in nets and things like that, the likelihood that you might get a cut or nick and get that Vibrio in in that cut or nick and maybe not wash your hands immediately because you're working are very high. So often people who contract this um, are, are in that industry or, or something similar, maybe a seafood worker. Which, which kind of brings me, I guess, to, to this next question. Looking at your reporting specifically here, Liz, how did you start fo- following along with, with this story, with this development? Right. I'm not, we have a wonderful health reporter here, uh, Grace Haba, who's going to do some um, coverage in the health arena. So normally this isn't my beat. I'm covering climate change and I was actually doing a, working on a different story. And so I was talking to people in the shrimping community, um, in the Outer Banks and around kind of the sound around Stumpy Point um, and, and Nags Head and Kill Devil Hill. So I've been talking to a lot of people in this community and I, uh, one person I was supposed to um, interview said that they weren't feeling well. Um, and then they said they were in the hospital and then they said it was Vibrio um, and they had been there for a long time. So basically I was just talking to a source and sort of uncovered it. And then I saw this wave of cases spike uh, across the Gulf. Um, just in recent days, we've seen eight deaths across um, Louisiana and Florida, about 32 cases of that dangerous strain, um, you know, and in, in states east of Texas. So it's really something that was creeping up the shore and then to see it happen in North Carolina. And then um, WRAL was able to get our numbers for North Carolina, you know, first, seeing that there are 59 cases of different strains of Vibrio, um, about seven of that dangerous strain and, and already one death this year, too. On that note, let's go ahead and take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to have more insight into what's causing more of these cases in the southeast and along the North Carolina coast. Welcome back to the WREL Daily Download. We're talking flesh-eating bacteria cases on the rise across the North Carolina coast. Liz, I said it earlier in your title, right? You're the WREL climate change reporter. 
So how does something like flesh-eating bacteria kind of fall in your wheelhouse? Interestingly, the climate that this bacteria and actually many other marine pathogens and other diseases um, thrive in is more likely and happening more often because of climate change. And there are two big factors here, salinity and temperature. So ocean waters, we are seeing record ocean temperatures, not just here off the Atlantic coast, but throughout the Gulf. You might remember last year, coral frying in the water because they were hot tub level temperatures. Well, that warm water is really just allowing this bacteria to reproduce faster. And the time, you know, generally there's a cool off in the winter where this bacteria doesn't really thrive. So the population kind of can back off a bit. But with warmer winters, with warmer water, the bacteria is really flourishing all year long. So we're seeing more of it and over more of the year. And then salinity is another factor. So that it really likes this, uh, you know, a scientist I talked to called it Goldilocks salinity. So, um, you know, just the right mixture. And climate change is is making extreme rainfall events and storms, stronger storms, more likely happening more frequently and and with a higher intensity. And so those big rain events can make more areas that have that Goldilocks salinity where this bacteria can really thrive. And just a few days ago, this area saw about four inches of rain that really made a lot of areas, um, you know, have have that perfect environment for this bacteria to just go crazy. We can believe that we're one of the factors um, to why we're seeing an uptick in cases. And if you look over the last five years, just in North Carolina, look at the averages, um, you know, we're seeing kind of an increasing trend. And, and just in the golf cases I mentioned earlier, these eight deaths we saw this year in Louisiana and Florida, they had, you know, one or two deaths in previous years. So this is a, a lot higher. Again, so rare, but a lot higher when you're looking at four times, five times, you know, the amount of deaths than we saw last year or the year before. And this goes back to some of those numbers we threw out there earlier, that this being the second highest midsummer total in five years of these Vibrio cases. And I believe in your reporting, Liz, you said that the, the normal kind of peak is is late August. So we still have a good amount of time to go where this is, you know, a, a problem. That's right. And um, the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services stressed, too, that those numbers were preliminary. They'll likely get more reports in. Um, you know, there, there might be some they haven't tallied that even that are already happening this month. Um, so we're, we'll likely see those cases rise. And again, as the water continues to get warmer, as we might see some storms here later in the season, um, you know, we, we might see those cases rise. So with all that being said, there's still a lot of time in the beach season for people to go to, you know, whether it's Carolina Beach, Wilmington, the Outer Banks, whatever it might is, might, or whatever it might be. What can folks do to protect themselves, keep themselves safe uh, for any kind of beach trips they may have this year? So if you have a cut, it's just probably not a good idea to get, or if you want to play it safe, you know, I'll say, uh, don't enter the water with an open wound. And again, that could be something like a fresh piercing or, um, you know, a small nick. Just be aware. Um, If you are going to go in the water, they have these waterproof bandages. So you could put one over it to protect yourself. Or right after you get out of the water, wash with soap and water um, to just, you know, disinfect that. That's just a great way to play it safe. Maybe cook uh, cook your seafood, um, especially if it's, you know, from the Gulf area, uh, cooking food thoroughly, that does kill the bacteria. So um, I'm a big raw oyster fan, sushi fan, so I understand that might be, you know, not worth it for some people, which is totally fine. Again, this is very rare. So... You know, it's a personal choice. I don't think people should necessarily avoid the beach because it's probably a similar likelihood to getting a shark bite. You know, we we don't want it to happen, but you can do some things to play it a little safer to prevent a shark bite. And you can do that with bacteria, too. And just taking a couple extra precautions could, you know, could make a big difference here. And especially keeping an eye on things. If you see that you have redness, swelling, discoloration, or, um, you know, diarrhea symptoms, of the Brio, um, you know, a day or so after water exposure, it's just a good idea to get medical attention quick. Again, this is something that moves quick. So waiting is not your friend here. Um, so just, you know, staying vigilant and, and taking those steps to stay safe. But we do want to stress, you know, this, this isn't a reason to like freak out or, or avoid the beast necessarily. Don't, don't necessarily cancel your plans, but, but a good idea to play it safe, especially if you have a, a cut or wound. 
Yeah, the kind of big picture and immediate future looking at there. Uh, and I guess one last question here for you, Liz. What what do you want people to take away uh, from this story, from the reporting you've done, from the, the conversations that you've had with people who are being impacted, live in these communities? What, what do you want people to take away from this? I think just within climate change, you know, it's, it's more than just the weather. It's more than just a long-term trend. It's more than just data. It's really touching every aspect of our lives, of ecosystems, of the the diseases that we're prone to and the risks that we have, not just from a storm being hit by a storm, but all of these other factors. And so I just think we should, as a society, look at this really holistically because, you know, this isn't just a problem for 50 years from now or a problem for the melting ice caps, right? This is in every corner of of the earth. And, and we all as a human species now have to learn how to, how to adapt. And so I, I just found that really interesting that as I'm learning more about this it, as a reporter, you know, that um, it's, it's not just this kind of one big thing, but there's a lot of little factors that are adding up to just changing our changing climate. And there's a lot that we can do about it to slow down those effects, to mitigate it, and just to be aware and adapt. So just hoping everyone stays safe out there. I know I hadn't heard of Vibrio before a week ago. So um, this is, um, you know, something that we might see higher cases of in years to come and just something to look out for. Some powerful insight there. That's WRL climate change reporter Liz McLaughlin. Liz, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for listening to the WRL Daily Download. Thanks for making us part of your morning routine. Another great way to get WRAL news is the Morning Briefing Newsletter. It's a daily email with triangle news, events, and headlines to help you get ready for the day. Sign up at WRAL.com newsletter.